Welcome to the History Slam podcast from ActiveHistory.ca. Here's your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to the History Slam, everybody. I am Sean Graham coming at you today nearly live from Ottawa, Ontario. Halloween week here in the nation's capital. And even though in certain parts of the country, trick-or-treating has been canceled, Halloween will still go on in some form. And why not delve in to the wonderful tradition of Halloween costumes with none other than the man, the myth, the legend himself, Aaron Boys, joins us about a half hour away from the middle of nowhere. Aaron, how are you doing tonight? I'm wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for having me back. Always a pleasure to have you, my friend. And this is something that th- this when I thought of, should we do a Halloween themed episode? And then I thought, of course we should, because it's a, a great reason to get the man, the myth, the legend back on. The people have been in wanting it. You know, as we've gone to this weekly schedule through the pandemic, you know, you haven't been on since the spring, which even in normal schedule times is a pretty long break i think that's the longest it's been since uh since i've been on it may be the year i was in boston I, maybe there was a longer break in there but sure. overall you know that the people are jonesing for a little man myth legend well hey i'm always thrilled to come back on here i love the conversations and as you always say got to give the people what they want that's right so uh this week what we're going to do is try to come up with or discuss some of the more popular costumes that people were wearing for Halloween through the 20th century. So we have some ideas. We've done some research about the costumes that people were wearing, some ideas that we have that could be representative of the decades through the 20th century for Halloween costumes. So we both have our respective lists here of of costumes that were popular and costumes that could be perhaps representative of the decade. So let's start way back in the 1910s. This is a decade, of course, that we are familiar with. Anyone who's listening who has not read our year in review, 100 year later brackets, we have done a year in review for each year of the 1910s. So we are very well versed in this decade. So in terms of Halloween costumes, what do you got as the most popular Halloween costume through the decade? So for the 1910s, what I was, what I was able to find, uh, and unfortunately I couldn't find a lot, but from my research, I found that the witch was the most popular costume in the 1910s. Yeah, and I, I would I haven't seen your list in its entirety, but I'm assuming the witch will be a common feature here. I mean, you mentioned your daughter's being a witch. We've talked before. There's an Ellie who is eight months older than your daughter, who is in my family. And I discovered yesterday that she's going to be a witch for Halloween as well. There you go. So it's very, very popular. Popular. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so a couple of the ones that I have that I think could be representative of the decade. One of them is a stolen Mona Lisa. Of course, Mona Lisa stolen in 1911. So for this costume, you would dress as Mona Lisa and just randomly yell occasionally, I'm lost, I'm lost. <laughs> just uh, see how people react to that. Um, uh, the other one that I, I have here is that you could be the temperance movement. Oh. And for this one, uh, if I was doing it, I would put on a suit and a tie uh-huh. and I would walk around a Halloween party and just knock the alcoholic drinks out of everybody's hand. You would be the no. most popular person at any party if you did that. Yeah, everyone would love me. It would be great. Um, And then the other one, of course, in the brackets, we did not allow for the First World War to be included because our friends over at Canada's First World War did such a good job of covering it, but also because we didn't want it to dominate the bracket. So I think it'd be fun as maybe a couple's costume is you had the before and after map of Europe for the First World War. So you have... One one person is has a shirt with the map of Europe from 1914, early 1914, and then somebody else has the map of Europe after the treaty in 1919. I like that. Yeah. And then, I mean, you can try to turn it into a drinking game or something like that and just try to see how many people can spot the differences on the, uh, on the map at the beginning of the night and then get after everyone has had a few, uh, say, pops, get them to do it again to see how many they can find. 
<laughs> yeah, that'd be a fun game, um, especially if you're there and you're you're part of the before and after and one of your friends is the temperance movement but then the temperance <laughs> movement can just be like you see you see this is why you shouldn't drink this is what causes world wars <laughs> <laughs> all right so that's the 1910s like the 1910s is tough just culturally so many so many costumes come from pop culture and of course there was a lot of pop culture during this decade but a lot of it was centered around the war or very nationalistic ideas certainly in North America. So a little less to draw from for the 19th century. So let's move on to the 1920s. A lot of stuff to mine in the 1920s. Of course, you have the jazz era, the idea of the flappers. You have more certainly industrial progress and new products that you can draw from. So for the 1920s, what are some of the things that you've found? Well, uh, one of the ones that I found, and not surprisingly, uh, this scared the hell out of me, uh, clowns. But they're not the clowns that, you know, we try to think of like, those are the ones, you know, when you hear people say that they're terrified of clowns, these yeah. are the images that I found of clowns from the 1920s that are nightmare inducing. I, I don't know what it is, but I didn't find a single image from the 1920s of a clown that wasn't absolutely terrifying. Interesting. So what, what specific element of the clown was so I, terrifying i don't know i think it's just like the makeup and the either the excessive smile or the lack of smile but just there was something about it that's very uh very unnerving and this, this is interesting too because i think you know when you think of the 1920s i think vaudevillian type of entertainment is it's still there certainly but it's kind of on the decline it's waning and i would assume that to a certain degree clowns were part of vaudeville uh, and maybe this is the moment where you, you do start to see things like ringling brothers really grow in popularity during this decade as well so the this transition of the clown figure from these various forms of of popular entertainment maybe it's this maybe these photos that you're seeing are just part of that transition that people are trying to capture what the spirit of a clown is uh, it very well could be, but uh, anyway, I'm having nightmares tonight. I don't know about you, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm having a nightmare because you sent me a picture of you as a clown. That is true. And it true. was freaky. My, no, my clown was incredible. Mm, incredibly creepy. Yes, right, I agree. Fine. Make to differ. With that assessment. Uh, so one of the things <laughs> that I thought for the 1920s is that you could be a car. Certainly the 1920s. The cars existed before the 1920s, but really comes into its own car culture in the United States during the 1920s. So you could be like a Model T where you have shoulder straps and then the front of the car, the back of the car, and you're basically where the driver would be. And then the whole time, again, I, I'm sort of picturing this as a, at a party, but I guess you could do this trick-or-treating too. And the whole time, every time you walk and move, you just have to go... <laughs> <laughs> the whole time again making you the most popular person at the party oh by far um but i think that would work especially for trick-or-treating i mean i don't know did the model t have even some sort of a storage capacity because then think of all the candy you could bring home yeah well if you're driving by yourself you got that whole passenger seat oh, at yes, least that is correct yeah yeah uh so so that was an idea i i had to really really encapsulate the 1920s what what else from the from this decade the other one that i found and you mentioned it before but of course was the flapper not surprising yeah. i mean trying to think of like you know you've got all these young kids going out and then they're seeing their parents and you know wanting to dress up as their parents and especially you know uh wanting to dress up as their mothers uh it's this you know the the classic flapper look from the 1920s uh, i think w is a perfect idea for uh for halloween yeah, I, I agree. And it's it's one of those costumes that it's interesting that you think of the flapper culture and the idea of what a flapper is. And I think oftentimes it gets put into this sexualized realm, but it's really not. I mean, there's certainly the Mae West type characters who were very sexual in what they were doing. But the flapper, the idea of the flapper is more of just having fun and you know being relaxed and you know going out and having drinks at a party right it's yeah exactly it, and that right so so it, it fits within that idea of just anyone could do it yeah like you said it was just about imagine you know just having a fun time and and what better time to just have fun than halloween 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, of course, not fun, but a costume that I think could also be good for the 1920s is that you could be the stock market crash Ooh. of 1929. And for this, all you need is a, a white T-shirt and you draw the path of the stock market <laughs> as like a chart on you. And then the drop goes from your shoulder all the way down to your toes. <laughs> so I guess you need to, you need to do it on your pants too, but all the way down. And then you're the stock market crash of 1929. Because, and especially, you know, if one person, again, a couple, one person goes as a flapper, one person goes as the stock market crash. Those are, I would argue, the two main symbols of the 1920s in North America, the things that you immediately remember. Oh, I agree. But the only thing I can think of to try to make it a little bit better for the stock market crash is you have to hand out real or fake dollar bills to everyone right. at the party. Because, what you know, at a certain time, the stock market crashes and you just have to go, well, I'm sorry, you know, everyone's broke, you know, I'm broke, I lost everything and just start handing out or just throw a big pile of uh, dollars or whatever into the air. That would be fun. Make your entrance into the party and be like, what up? Boom. Exactly. Just kind of be like, yeah, all right, everyone, it's over. Here you go. Make it. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So uh, 1930s, this is the decade that certainly professionally I've studied the most and a a decade that, again, there's so much associated with the depression of the 1930s and rightfully so. But from a pop culture standpoint, the 1930s were amazing. So much great stuff came out in the 1930s, both on the film side and then you have music, the advent of radio and so much popular radio program come out. It was really a golden decade for popular culture. So a lot to to mine here. So what do you got? Uh, the one that I found most interesting was Mickey Mouse. Obviously, Mickey Mouse was mm. uh, created by Walt Disney uh, in the 1920s. Um, but as you said, with the expansion of pop culture, thanks to radio and uh, cinema and stuff like that, really starting to reach across North America, uh, kids, obviously, you could see wanting to dress up as Mickey Mouse. Yeah, that, that's a really good one, too. And that old Mickey, that 1920s, 30s Mickey, looks yeah. a little different from today's Mickey. And... St- I think it looks, frankly, a little better than today's Mickey. Um, almost, I don't know, more classically cartoony, if that's a way to describe it. Yeah, like so when that, you think of that like original Steamboat, Mickey. Yeah, it's like Steamboat Willie Mickey. Yeah, yeah, that I really like that type of Mickey, and I think they use that more in the Disney shorts that they do today. So yeah, I'm I'm all in on that, and uh, yeah, Mickey Mickey Mouse, uh, powerful cultural figure. Yeah. It all started with a mouse, as, uh, as Walt used to say. Uh, so one of the ones that I had, 1933, was the release of King Kong, the feature film. So for this one, you would put on a costume to make you look like King Kong. But the joy of doing this is that you just walk around the whole time swatting things out of your <laughs> way. <laughs> and it's part, it's part of your, your costume and the character you're playing. So you know, you're at the party and someone's, got a hopefully a paper plate with not really messy food and you just knock it out of their hand <laughs> but see yeah. then i think you need to almost have the couple's costume uh or even just friends even and have one of you one person be king kong and then one or two be fighter planes and oh then, yeah so that, that's so that, true while yeah. you're walking around the room when you smack at a paper plate, you need you need like another person to kind of come in with the with the sound effects and everything like that, and then you start swatting even more. Absolutely, that's a really good point. Yeah, it is a great group costume idea. Yeah, I mean, you'd be thrown out of the party very quickly, but I really like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that that would be a lot of fun. <laughs> and what what else you got for the thirties? The other one I had was uh, Toy Soldier. Uh, I thought that was really interesting. Uh, so the images that I found was of uh, little kids dressed up uh, almost like continental soldiers from the American Revolution or say, you know, the Napoleonic Wars, depending on which side of the pond you're on. Um, you know, that very prim, proper, perfect uniform, that soap top uh, cap. Uh, and because it's the 1930s, unsurprisingly, uh, a couple of them that I saw was, uh, I don't think they were real rifles, 
but they looked really re- real, and a lot of them have had bayonets on them. Right. Well, I, this is one of these things that is a lesson from the First World War that a lot of the allied countries, particularly Canada and the United States, came out of the First World War and recognized how unprepared they were. Right? That was in the review process of the war. Both countries realized that hey, we probably need to be a little more prepared. So things like advocating for physical education and the more sports in schools, part of that was influenced by wanting to make sure you had young people who are physically fit and able to go fight a war if we needed to go fight a war. So as we get into the 1930s and the war clouds in Europe are starting to to sort of grow, what we see is a lot of small indicators that the country is expecting and preparing for a war. And toy soldiers and dressing up as soldiers is part of that. And making kids and younger people think that being a soldier is cool and is fun is really part of a larger effort to prepare for what of course comes at the end of the decade with the second world war. So I can see why those things would be popular towards the end of the decade where in the early 1920s, nobody would have been dressing up as a soldier. Nobody was playing with toy soldiers, sort of the the trauma from the first world war and the mourning that was going on when if allowed for that, so it's interesting to see 15, 20 years later that these things, these toys, these costumes are used for this broader cultural purpose. Yeah, for sure. So on a related note, one of the costumes that I had for the 1930s, and again, this would be something that you might have seen, and I'm sure people did this in Canada and the United States, probably in Britain and France as well. You would see representations of Hitler. And representations of Hitler in a in a dumb way. So like dumb Hitler, kind of if you've ever seen the movies, The Producers or the stage show of The Producers, where Hitler is presented in a very over the top, silly way, kind of to delegitimize Hitler. And I, I, I know that I've seen costumes from this era like that, where people are dressing up for the express purpose of making fun of him and delegitimizing him making him not as powerful or as threatening. Wow. And that's something that you really see in this era. Yeah. I've, I've, I've never seen images of that. That's incredible. Yeah. And, and again, if, if you, if, if you can't really picture what I'm saying, there was a movie too, I think it was called Jojo rabbit or something from a couple of years ago where the kid in the movie has this relationship in his head with Hitler and he's a Jewish kid and he has his imaginary friend is Hitler. And the whole point there too, to a certain degree is again, to mock Hitler. And that's what you see in the producers. And that's what you were seeing with these costumes as well. Just make fun of him. He's not a real threat. Just do whatever you can to put him down. And, and these costumes were in existence through the second world war. So for the 1940s, one of the ones that I have is the sailor photo from the end of the Second World War in Times Square, you have the sailor kissing the woman. Now, of course, this is a couple's costume that don't if don't just dress up as a sailor and go around kissing people. That's not a good idea. You no. should not do that under any circumstance. No, no. But if you have a couple that that could be an option for the photo, that just iconic photo that to me is the end of the Second World War. If, if anybody asked me ever about the celebrations or what the reaction was on the civilian side for the end of the second world war. It's that photo to me. And I think it's just etched in at least my memory when I think of that moment. Yeah, no, no, I I agree completely with you. So what do you got then for the 1940s? What's your number one? Uh, Number one for the 1940s. It makes a second appearance on there. Witches. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you mentioned that. More witches. I wonder why yeah. in the 1940s that witches I that's the thing. I, renewal. I, I, I guess I'd have to do a little bit more digging. But uh, yeah, I, I saw on a couple of things there saying that witches made a comeback in the 1940s. Hmm. I guess, yeah. I, I guess, when did the movie come out? Um, Wizard of Oz, right? Uh, would, that's would witches have influenced... Okay. Yeah, I wonder if witches influenced that at all? Oh, sort of maybe. this popular representation of witches. 
Yeah, I don't know. And then because then you can have the dichotomy of the good witch and the bad witch kind of thing like yeah. that. And you know how the different uh, the different costumes there. Yeah, I don't know. Interesting. Um, so another one that I had for the 1940s, this is very American centric, but sad Thomas Dewey is one. <laughs> So you dress up like Thomas Dewey, presidential candidate in 1948. You dress up like Thomas Dewey and you carry around the headline, the famous headline, the morning after the election in 1948 that says Dewey beats Truman. And you have to carry that around and then you paint a tear under one of your eyes <laughs> and you just walk around being sad all night. So I sad love Thomas that. Dewey. I love it. But once again, that can be another either couples or friends costume, right? Because then you have the one person is a sad Thomas Dewey and the other person, the victorious Harry Truman. Uh, and you can have yes. Harry Truman walking around the newspaper all night, uh, shoving it in uh, poor Dewey's face. Yes. And as he famously does, there's a photo of Harry Truman at the back of a train, I believe, yeah, where he's yeah, holding yeah, up yeah. that headline after he has won the election. Oh, yeah. Just beaming. Yes. You've never seen anybody as happy. You want, you know, in your life, you know, that meme of like, you want somebody to look at you the way this, like you want somebody to look at you the way Truman looks at that newspaper. Oh, be, without a doubt. <laughs> he is so happy in that moment. Um, uh, another one that I had for nineteen the 1940s is that you could be Citizen Kane, or Citizen Kane comes out in the 1940s. And this is a really easy one. You just got to put on a suit and walk around with a snow globe because that's all Kane does in the movie. I've never seen it. So spoiler alert, 70 years later, uh, he dies in the first scene. Oh. And the movie is recreating or going back and trying to figure out what his life is. But in, in the shot where he dies, he's holding a, a snow globe that falls and, and breaks. See, and the, only, the only reference I know about that is from the Simpsons, of course, where Mr. Burns is holding onto a snow globe and it falls and breaks when he's reminiscing about his lost bear Bobo. Yes. And then they go and find Bobo, right? Yeah. It's the same. That, and that's then, what the movie, and, and then the <laughs> other joke is when, uh, when they go to the museum, Homer, Bart and Lisa, and they say, hey, look, it's the cane from Citizen Kane. At least yeah. goes, there is no cane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, Citizen Kane would be, I think, a pretty easy one. Yeah, just have a snow globe. Say Rosebud a lot. You're fine uh, for the 1940s. You uh, do you have anything all about else the me? lazy costumes, my friend. I love it. Well, again, I, I'm not great at the ideas. I, I'm, I'm happy to wear. If somebody gives me a very elaborate costume with a lot of steps involved, I will put it on and I will have a good time. I just can't think of them. That's fair. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, what else you got for the forties? That was it. Uh, my forties okay, was yeah. My forty. My research there was terrible as compared to yours. Just you know, you just hey. I mean, I guess all the witches were just brewing up various things, and uh, that's all they could come up with. Yeah. Keeping themselves in power. All right. So uh, so let's go to the nineteen fifties then. Great decade for certainly TV characters, a lot of political stuff in the 1950s as well. So what do you got? The big one. And I think that, again, at least in North America, you've probably had thousands of young kids dressing up as Davy Crockett. Yeah. I, I, think, I, I yeah. don't know what it is, is but uh, when I read this on a, on a bunch of different places, it's like, yeah, I, could, I can just see it. You know, with a coonskin cap, I can just, just see kids being Davy Crockett. Yeah, for sure. That, it's just an iconic character. Right? Yeah. The, and the hat, really, it really is the hat. There's not that much else that you need in that costume. No, I mean, just a, a, maybe some rugged clothes and, and that's it. As long as you've got the cap, you're golden. Yeah, uh, for sure. For sure. Uh, and, and I think another character that would be defined by the hair or what's on your head, at least, is Elvis Presley. Oh, yes. He really comes of age in the 1950s. Uh, that's one that would be very popular. Tough to pull off because so much is required for the legs. Right? You got to have that leg movement down. And then I would also give bonus points if you had, you know, like fried bologna sandwiches that you're giving out to people. See, I, I, I thought you were going somewhere else when you said it's kind of tough to, to, to pull off because I thought you were going to mention hair. Well, as someone who doesn't have any hair, <laughs> I, I try not to make too many references. Well, and that, that's where I thought you were going with it. So you kind of surprised me with the legs. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, another idea I had that is 
really related to hair, I think, to a certain degree, Lucille Ball, right? Ooh. Lucy with her famous red hair uh, that she would have up a lot, a very iconic figure. Now, the rule for this one, for me at least, is that you can only play Lucy is if you had the ability to do the voice. And I will add parenthetically, nobody can adequately do the voice, so perhaps nobody should dress up as Lucy. But Lucille Ball, iconic 1950s figure. Oh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I agree with your caveat that you have to be able to pull off the Lucy impression perfectly or else don't even try. Yeah, for 100%. Yeah. Uh, what else, anything else for the 1950s? Uh, for me, another one that uh, I thought was quite interesting because I didn't think the character would have dated back this long, but uh, Zorro. Oh, yeah. yeah. With the sword. Yeah. Exactly. You know, like you just need a, a black hat, uh, a bandana. Uh, or sorry, no, not a bandit. What am I talking about? Um, uh, a mask over your eyes and you're good to go. Yeah. And if you can do that Z, then you're, you, you have to be able to sort of get the Z yeah. in some way. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You got to have it on your, I don't know, on your clothing or something like that. Or if you're yeah. able to uh, to mimic the Z in the air. But uh, yeah, uh, Zoro was another. The other one that I thought uh, or that I found, and again, not surprising, but I'm, I'm kind of surprised that it took this long for it to pop up on the list that I saw. Superman. Oh, yeah. I think Superman was from the, it was created in the 1920s, was he not? I, yeah, it, I think it was earlier than 1950s for sure. Yeah, and that's, and that's what I mean. I was kind of surprised to see that it took that long for Superman to make it on any of these lists. Maybe it's one of these things where it was harder to get the stuff required for it. Oh, and maybe. with more mass production of things in the 1950s, it was easier to get it. Yeah. Well, maybe. Uh, well, so another thing that wouldn't have been hard to recreate as a costume for the 1950s, I think it could be Joseph McCarthy. Ooh. And here, here's my idea. So you need a, a, a fake mustache or a real mustache if you have a mustache. Okay. Put on a suit, walk around with a clipboard, and just say things that are obviously not true. <laughs> and then you're Joseph McCarthy. It's really easy. And then I think what you need to do is start writing down names on, on that clipboard. And then when yeah. everyone asks you why you keep a name, just say, don't worry about it. And then at the end of the night or throughout the night, you can just say, Hey, I, I, I've, I've got dozens of names on this list. And then, and then go up to the next person and say, I've got thousands of names on this list. And then by the end of the night, I've got a couple names on this list, you know, just, just keep inflating <laughs> or changing the numbers. Yes. And then if anybody ever gives you attitude, just go, you're on the list. Yeah. Or just kind of say, Hey, everyone, I'd like to have your attention. This person's a communist. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I think it'd be an, a, a pretty easy one to pull off, uh, similar yeah. to the theme that I have. And I just want to fact check ourselves. First edition of Superman in the action comics. So Superman number one comes yeah. out in April of 1938. Oh, okay. So 1930s, not the 20s. Okay. So, I mean, a little bit closer, I guess. But uh, again, I'm still yeah. kind of surprised that it took uh, over a decade. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, you would think that that could be a 40s costume. But uh, yeah, but not no. to say, of course, that some kids didn't dress up as Superman, but uh, I'm just kind of surprised that it didn't make it like the highest lists uh, until the 50s. Yeah, absolutely. So anything else from the 50s? Uh, the only other one that I had, and uh, once again, I thought this was really interesting, was uh, Bugs Bunny. Oh, yeah. Love Bugs Bunny. Yeah. And especially like the uh, the classic Warner Brothers cartoons. Uh, I don't know about you, but growing up, uh, uh, the Looney Tunes show used to be on uh, Saturday afternoons, I believe. Um, yes, it was so on Global winter, at 4 o'clock. Be... Don't at me. What up? Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So my brother and I would be outside playing hockey all day. And then uh, around 4 o'clock, obviously, in the winter, when, this, when the sun was down, we'd come in and... Uh, warm ourselves honestly by the fire i was lucky i had a wood-burning fireplace when i was a kid and uh we'd watch bugs bunny nice yeah uh, those cartoons were always really fun and i oh, actually yeah. went to the the national art center a couple of years ago where they did a uh, looney tunes with the orchestra so on the they had a giant screen in south southern hall where they were airing or showing the looney tunes cartoons and then the orchestra was doing the live instrumental and it was oh, incredible no way 
Yeah, that would have been amazing. Yeah, su- super, super fun. So, uh, all yeah. right, so there you have the 1950s. Let's go to the 1960s. Lot here. You got so much pop culture. You got a lot of political things that that could be relevant here. So, where are you landing on some of the more popular things from the 60s? For me, the biggest one, of course, is the rise of the superhero. Now, obviously, we mentioned Superman, uh, but the one that I saw and I really liked was Spider Man. Uh, and I saw a bunch of homemade costumes as well from like images from the 60s uh, of all sorts of uh, different versions, if you will, of Spider-Man. But I mean, they were all pretty true to the source material. Really? That, that I find that kind of surprising because sometimes when those homemade costumes and you see them, people have taken some creative license. Yeah, oh, yeah. But I mean, the ones at least that I saw were real. I was really impressed with them. Nice. And yeah, that that superhero 1960 stuff. Yeah, just so much was in there, so much packed in. And uh, I, I would say that the the only other time that we've seen that type of type of renaissance in the popularity of superheroes is over the past decade with oh, yeah. the Marvel f- films and like just so many superhero movies coming out. Really does remind me, not that I was alive in the 1960s to experience, but and not that I go to the movies now either, but just in, in sort of their presence within the popular zeitgeist of, of North American culture and society that it really is the 60s and then recently when they were at their zenith. Oh, yeah. So for the 1960s, here's one that I have, and I want to know what you think about this because it requires four people. Okay. And... It's the Beatles. So you're going to be the Beatles, but you're going to be the Beatles through the decade. So one person will wear the black suit with the black tie, the the proper hair. Yeah. But then the other three people are slowly showing the progression to the final person is full on Lonely Hearts Band album cover. Oh, I like that. So just that slow progression of the, the Beatles through the decade. That's brilliant, yeah. Now, the problem with this, of course, is that you need three other friends who would go along with it. <laughs> I don't it know. I, I, think, I, I don't. I see. I was going to disagree. I, I think that's pretty clever, and I think a lot of people, um, at least of our generation now, obviously, we didn't grow up with the Beatles playing live. But, uh, but I mean, the Beatles still has such a massive cult following even now. I think it'd be pretty easy to find four people willing to do that. Yeah, perhaps. And hopefully someone does that. Maybe someone's even actually already done that. Maybe like It seems like a costume that would be fun to pull off and would uh, would turn a lot of heads at a party. Oh, absolutely it would. Especially if you could sing. Like if Ooh. the four of you could just bust out an acapella, uh, acapella version of She Loves You, then that'd be something. And the, I'm at a loss. I'm just like, you would win <laughs> Halloween. <laughs> all right so uh what what else for the 60s what else is on your list uh honestly for me it was just it was the superheroes it was just like everything everything and anything superheroes all right so let me drop one more on you 1960s the decade starts with john f kennedy saying that we are going to put a man on the moon not because it is easy but because it is difficult it is the decade of the space race so i think you want to have an astronaut costume to represent the 1960s. I'm just trying to debate which astronaut do I want to go as? Do I want to go as Neil Armstrong or Buzz Aldrin? There you go as any astronaut. You or put your you own get, name on it. Or do you get, you know, you try to go, do what you could do. And then here's another one, you know, another group costume. So you've got Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. And then you're, the third member of your group has to stay about 10 feet away from you at all times, hovering like Michael Collins. <laughs> oh, poor Michael Collins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, th- that I that would actually be really funny. Uh, he sort of just has to sit there and not get to experience the party that you go to. Yeah, exactly. Or, you know, and then uh, as Neil and Buzz get up. Outside, to... <laughs> make him stand outside and look through the window the whole, the whole night. <laughs> And then make sure you tell everyone, oh, yeah, he's our designated driver. <laughs> so the, the other 
add on that I might put to a, a astronaut costume is if you could get one of those plushes that you can put on your shoulder of a monkey to represent the monkey astronaut that the Russians sent. So you have your monkey astronaut friend with you the whole time. Okay. Well, you can't oh, forget wait, the wait monkey a second. Astronaut. Did the Russians send the monkey or was it the Americans? Because I know Ooh, the Russians right. sent, uh, yeah, but because the Russians sent uh, the dog. Right. All right. Let me, I'm, I'm going to fact check this. fact check this one. Yes. Yeah. So I, yes, you're right. I have... You are correct. The Americans. So my apologies uh, okay. on that. Yes. The, the Americans were the first to send a monkey into space. They sent Albert into sub, into a subspace altitude of 39 miles oh. on a rocket. Actually, this isn't even the 60s. They did this in 1948. Wow. What up, Albert? Good job. That's incredible. I, yeah, I would yeah. have assumed it, or maybe even the 50s. 1948, wow. So, uh, yeah, so maybe for the 60s, you shouldn't have the monkey plush, and you could just be, yeah, Buzz Aldrin or Neil Armstrong. Yeah. Or yeah. Michael Collins. Or Michael Collins. Hey, you know what? Michael Collins did way more in his life than uh, I will. <laughs> right? He went to uh, the moon. He did more in his life than you and I put together. <laughs> yeah. So we, 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 we're not. Yeah. I mean, I, I could just think, though, that Michael Collins, you get there. You want to. Like you're there. It's like the moon's right there. Yeah. You want to land, but you can't. Yeah, but you can't. But, you know, team player and you got to have team players. That's right. So, uh, so let's move on to the 1970s. Um, in terms of pop culture, I think pop culture in the 1970s is a little harder to draw from, just given the general tone of movies and TV in this decade, where things get a little darker. So it's hard to draw out Halloween co costumes because I always associate Halloween costumes as being fun. So it's a little harder to draw out fun things from the 1970s, but certainly people did during that decade. So what do you got? So I actually had the opposite. Uh, I found, so in the 1970s, you really have the rise of the mass produced plastic masks. And everything that I could find was kids wearing masks. It was a mask of a specific character. Now, uh, I've got a bunch of them here, so I won't be able to go, we won't be able to talk about all of them in depth. Uh, but a lot of them brought back uh, memories because they were even popular in the 80s and some of them into the 90s. Um, so we've got Charlie Brown. Uh, Casper the Friendly Ghost, uh, Barbie, mm. Scooby-Doo, Roadrunner. Here's one from the 70s that made it into the 80s. Like, I think I remember having, like, hand-me-down toys into the 90s. The Popples. Um, the Popples? I'm not yeah, familiar the, with the Popples. The Popples. Yeah, Google it right now. Check out the Popples. Okay. Keep, yeah, I'm, I'm Googling. Keep going. Okay. Uh, the Pound Puppies. Again, oh yeah, made, made okay. it into the you know the late '80s, early '90s. Uh, Wonder Woman was uh, absolutely, obviously, the 1970s. That's a fantastic costume. Um, and then uh, He Man would, I guess, would be on the opposite uh, side of that. So, uh, okay, like I said, there was there was a bunch of them there that I was uh, that I was looking and I was looking at these masks. And I'm like, man, these are these are pretty incredible. Interesting. So I'm not spelling popples right just based on what I'm coming up with. Uh-oh. Do I want to know what you're Googling? Uh, so P-O-P-P-L-E-S. P-O-P-P-L-E-S. Okay. Popples toys. I did mean Popples toys. Oh, my goodness. These are creepy. Oh, wait a second. But this here says it's from the 19, 1980s. Oh, man. Uh-oh. I, I uh -oh. messed up here. Got the list wrong. Hey, Uh-oh. So that's, see, that's why I knew the Popples were the 1980s. Like I remember seeing them around. So, okay. That makes that more sense that they'd be the 1980s. Okay. But yeah. Okay. So, but in, in terms of the overall of what you were talking about, I can see why the mask really made cartoon characters more accessible as Halloween costumes that no doubt about that. And certainly there are a lot of, of popular cartoon characters from this decade. I'm just thinking maybe more on the adult side, it would be harder to draw things out of the 1970s. Whereas, you know, in the 1950s, you have adult entertainment that is a little more on the lighthearted side. 
where you don't have that quite as much in terms of the things that really enter the the canon of the 1970s, if you will, mm-hmm. or the the popular imagination of the 1970s. I think it's a little tougher for adults. One of the other ones that I came up with that I think could be fun is Archie and Edith Bunker. Okay. If you're a couple, that you could be Archie and Edith. Again, these are more character plays that if you if you have somebody who can do the Edith voice, that it's a lot of fun to do it. And bonus points if you have somebody who could be Sammy Davis Jr. to recreate the famous Archie Bunker, Sammy Davis Jr. kiss, where Sammy Davis Jr. kisses him on the cheek at the end of the episode. So if you can have that, that's great. Like to me, that's one of those touchstone moments of the 1970s. And Archie Bunker as that buffoonish character who you're laughing at, not with. Uh, and Edith, the, the sweetheart who's with them. Uh, that that to me is just, again, representative of the 1970s. And the that Norman Lear genre of show trying to find comedy in these darker moments and these darker elements of society that to me is one of those ways that you can pull some some halloween fun out of that decade and with that my friend you have pulled yourself out of the depths from stagflation and you're back at the party there you go all you need is a little arch and eat it (laughs) then you can sing the song it's great it'll be fine (laughs) <laughs> um, what what else uh, do you got anything else for the 1970s that really stands out to you um no like you said i mean the masks was just the be all yeah. and end all of uh of halloween yeah so the only other thing that i could think of that would work for the 1970s is you could be all of the star wars characters at the same time yeah just because the first one came out in 1977. So just be the Star Wars characters. Okay. Uh, so there you have it. 1980s. Another one uh, that I thought for the 1980s, you could be all the Star Wars characters. <laughs> be all the Star Wars characters. Pretty easy. Well, but at that time, you've got two movies to pick from. Yes, yeah, so you have even more characters. Yeah, you could have some. Uh, I would love to see someone try to get Jabba the Hutt in there as well. That would be hard. That would be hard. Yeah. Um, Imagine so, if the person has Jabba the Hutt naturally, like just, and that's their costume. If you, again, that's another one. If you can pull off that voice, good on you. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, um, so for the 1980s, what, what stands out to you? Uh, the two big ones. Now, again, I've got a massive list here because the 80s was, it was a little bit easier to find. Um, but now, of course, we've got horror movies and, you know, yeah. the rise of the slasher films. And so uh, what better characters represent the 1980s than Freddy Krueger and Jason from Halloween? Yeah, absolutely. Like those are iconic characters. Definitely fit in with the Halloween vibe. Oh, sir, I said I said Jason from Halloween. That's Michael Myers. My apologies, but uh, just Jason and the hockey mask. Yes. Uh, yeah. Good fact checking on yourself. Well yeah. Done. Geez. Um, you know, you <laughs> start getting hate mail for that for uh, for that one. <laughs> uh, but uh, no. But I agree. Yeah. Th- those are those things, and I think you even see it today still that those characters are just so iconic that that's what people want to be for Halloween. Yeah, even 40 years later, I mean, Freddy Krueger is still relevant. Obviously, they're still making bad remakes of uh, of it. But I, I I, don't know about you. I don't think I've ever actually seen a Freddy Krueger movie. I No, I hate scary movies. Okay. Like, I can't. Even movies that aren't really that scary, I don't like. Okay. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I, I can't say I don't want to jump. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of horror either, but I, I don't know, just the slashers, I, I never really got into. I know my brother-in-law uh, has probably seen every single slasher flick that has ever been created from, doesn't matter, <laughs> as long if it's been dubbed into English, then he's seen it. Wow. Oh yeah, he loves them. I, I don't, I honestly don't get the appeal, my, like myself, that it's all about some evil person killing people. Like, that, that tends to be what the plots are, right? Yeah. Like I don't, yeah. that, that doesn't necessarily appeal to me, but maybe I just don't understand the genre well enough. Oh, that's fair. So, uh, so one for the 1980s that I had was Randy Savage, ah, the macho man. Yeah. Really at the top of his powers during the 1980s. And it's an easy one to do because you just got to get any random assortment of colors that you have and wear them because he was very indiscriminate about the colors that he would wear on his wrestling gear. They didn't have to match. They didn't have to have any sort of continuity. They didn't have to make any sense. So just wear all the colors that you have and then just 
go around all night just saying, oh, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty much what the Macho Man did uh, in terms of character. I mean, it, obviously one of the greatest of all time to uh, to do it in professional wrestling, but certainly a, a fun character to do. And I don't know if Slim Jim still exists, but of course, if you have a Slim Jim, it adds that much more to it. Uh, but then, of course, you need uh, you need a partner to go with you or at least so if you have a partner who goes with you or if you see this person dressed up uh, as this person while you're Randy Savage, Hulk Hogan. Yes. And then, about yeah. you know, if, if, let's say you're going as Hulk Hogan. You got to be able to at the end of the night, tear that yellow shirt apart and, uh, you know, with the flaming red or, or yellow and red bandana. But like if you guys or if you see another person as Randy Savage and Hulk Hogan. And, you know, they like stare each other down and, you know, full wrestle. That'd be even better. Yeah. The mega powers, when the mega powers implode, that huge moment in the 1980s. Yeah. If you could recreate that. And again, if, again, couples, uh, if you have uh, a woman who wants to be Miss Elizabeth, the famous character who would, they were married in real life and then married on screen and the only professional wrestling wedding in which a wedding actually happened where the two oh. people actually got married because every other professional wrestling wedding that has taken place on screen, it's always in service of a storyline, obviously. And the wedding doesn't actually happen, but that one, they actually let it happen as the main event, uh, I believe of a pay-per-view. Wow. And people wanted to see it. So super, uh, super popular during that era yeah. of the 1980s. So what else we got for the eighties? Cause I have one more here. Okay, I got a couple. Once again, like the 70s, I've got a list here. I'll just mention them off. Again, too many and too many good ones that we could start chatting about. Uh, Cabbage Patch Kids. Now, those masks that I found were, were really creepy. Um, <laughs> Care Bears. Uh, again, yeah. like, you know, the mask for the Care Bears was uh, was a good one. And uh, did you know that they they now have a remake of the Care Bears? Really? Yeah. Ellie watches it and it's terrible in my opinion. Oh, like it's not even that's... anywhere close to the original Care Bears. Well, is that true or is that just you being an old man saying that it's not like it was in my day? Both. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. Oh, anyway, uh, anyone listening, please check out this new Care Bears and let us know if, if it's, if it's just me and I'm being grumpy about it. But anyway, uh, I see Ellie watching it and I'll say, what are you watching? Care Bears. And I want to say to her every time, that's not Care Bears. But, and she doesn't care if you think it's the real Care Bears, because to, to her, it's the real Care Bears. That's true. However, and the one that I had on, on the, my buzz, dad, but I had one on my list, um, that they've also, they've got a, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, a reboot of is the Muppet Babies. Oh, really? The Muppet Babies was huge, of course, in the 80s. And I remember watching it as a kid. Um, and yeah, they've got a reboot of the Muppet Babies. And Ellie watches it religiously. And I tell, I told her one morning, I said, I used to watch the show when I was a kid. She got all wide eyed. She's like, did you? And it's just like, <laughs> so that's one actually that they did a good job with. But uh, Muppet Babies costumes was another one. Uh, Strawberry Shortcake. Oh, I yeah. thought that was really interesting. Uh, Teddy Ruxpin. If anyone uh, yeah. remembers that toy, yeah, Teddy Ruxpin been in there. Uh, and then, of course, I'm saving this one for the last, Alf. Oh, of course, yeah. I mean, that mask is so iconic for, for anyone who knows the 1980s. Yeah, that, that was a show that really took off for reasons that I never fully understood. Having watched it, Within the last 10 years, I watched a bunch of them and I, was, I, I don't really understand the appeal of the show, but yeah, just a huge character and really the, the perfect thing that you would want in a Halloween costume, yeah. right? A character that is super recognizable. You can go out and probably buy that costume anywhere. You can make it probably relatively easily, I would think too. There's not a lot of you know color contrast, for instance, so you get just if you have brown and you could probably pull it off. Yeah. That's really all the things you want in a Halloween costume. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the other one that I have for the 1980s, a little can con for us on a, on a, on a podcast episode, couples costume, Joey Jeremiah and Caitlin Ryan. Huh? Oh my God. So 
so you, 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 you can excuse yourself for about 45 seconds. So okay. the key I, I, to this, I'm, I'm going to go and pet the dog. <laughs> so the key to this costume is the person who's playing Joey Jeremiah has to know the lyrics to everybody wants something. Of course, the, the big song of the zip remedy from Degrassi and Caitlin Ryan, whoever's playing Caitlin Ryan has to know who Tessa Campanelli is for the famous line in the movie that they did at the end of the series after Degrassi high, when they've graduated, they did a movie and Joey Jeremiah and Caitlin are together as a couple. And then Tessa Campanelli gets involved and Caitlin has the, to me, the greatest line in any of the Degrassi canon where she confronts Joey Jeremiah about Tessa Campanelli. So you have to know who Tessa Campanelli is the character to be able to pull that off. But for me, as somebody who grew up in the nineties, watching those shows, I think of eighties Canada, or at least eighties Toronto, it's Joey Jeremiah and Caitlin Ryan as the principals on that show. So for the eighties, to me, there's nothing really that captures it quite like those two characters. Okay. I'm back. What'd I miss? You won't understand. It's, just, it's between me and the people, oh, okay. between me and the audience. You're, you're fine. So okay, let's, cool. uh, so let's move on to the 1990s. One of the things I have here is that you could be all the Star Wars characters. Oh, the Star Wars characters. Now, Star Wars, that, that came out in 1999, right? I don't know. They all <laughs> they, they, they all come out all the time. Like <laughs> Star Wars, the, you know, in, in a thousand years, if people still exist, they're going to be paying taxes, death will still exist, and people will be dressing up as Star Wars characters. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I'm confident in. That's a pretty good bet. Um, so 1990s, a lot here. This is the this is where we grew up, man. You know, this is where we, you know, we were both born around the same time. I yeah. think a year or two apart. Yeah. And this is where this is the decade where we grew up. So we have a lot of personal experience for the 1990s. So what do you got? Oh, I had so much fun looking at the 1990s. Uh, the big one for me, and I was chatting with a friend, and uh, we agreed that this is one of the best ones ever, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yes. I just, I was obsessed with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles when I was a kid. And uh, I don't know if I actually ever went as a Ninja Turtle for Halloween, though. Um, but I know a lot of friends who did. Yeah, it was definitely a popular costume every year, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I can't remember which one was the most popular. I want to say Michelangelo. I still th see. I still think it's it's a debate, and it, it's definitely up for uh, up for discussion. Because uh, I got into a discussion about uh, about this actually with our good friend Doctor Thompson, and uh, his name being Michael was a fan of Michelangelo, and I said, "No, it's Raph. Raphael's the best Ninja Turtle." Okay. So which one's the worst? Was there a defined worst one? I don't think there was a worst one. Per well, personally, I don't know. I, like I said, I was obsessed with the Ninja Turtles, so it didn't matter which right. one. Right. You just didn't want to be Shredder. If someone was like, oh, we'll be the Turtles, you can be Shredder. You know, I don't know. Yeah, no, no one wanted to be the bad guy. But someone had yeah. to be, and then, you know, you know, that whole taking one for the team thing, like someone had to be the bad guy or else it really didn't work. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and and if you could just basically if you could be the Ninja Turtles, it's an excuse to eat pizza the whole time. Oh yeah, it's great. So that's a real win. Uh, all right, what else for the nineteen nineties? Uh, the other one that I thought uh, was so true, and now I'm going to go back to the slasher thing, the scream mask. Yes, that was huge. So, and I mean, I can't even remember how many times I saw that. I think I, in, I can't remember what's, uh, I might've been in high school um, or junior high. And I remember the school saying that no one was allowed to actually wear that. Really? Yeah. Like too scary? Too intense? I don't know if it was too scary or maybe because the whole mask thing and, uh, you know, you have to still being able to be identifiable some of that. I, I don't know. But just, I remember, I remember uh, the school saying that uh, you weren't allowed to wear it. And probably rightfully so. I mean, the mask is a murderer, right? The person wearing the mask in the movie is a murderer. Yes. So, um, so I have a couple here for the 1990s that uh, are a little less on the cultural side, a little more current eventy. So one of them is that you could be the destroyed Berlin Wall. 
Ah. Now this one takes a little bit of effort. And my idea was to be the, the destroyed Berlin Wall is that you have to walk around in dragging bags of bricks behind you. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be. Because um, I don't know how else you could be a destroyed wall. So you really have to. <laughs> If you need to get your workout in that night, that's how you do it. Yeah, I don't know how you pull that one off. I like it, but uh, I think you're going to have a little bit of trouble pulling that one off. Uh, the other idea that I had was that you could be dial-up internet. Oh. And so for this one, yeah. you have to walk around really slowly. You can't move fast the whole night. Uh-huh. And whenever somebody asks you a question, all, you, all you're allowed to do is go, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like you have to make that noise. So you're not allowed to have any conversation, any discussion. You and then if someone else, that. and then if someone else starts talking to you, you have to just drop because the connection drops. Like you know, if someone tried phoning yeah. you. Yeah, and you have to basically, you know, like when you're doing, if someone's dancing the robot and they just go limp. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then your dial-up internet. Oh, I like that. Yeah. So th- those are the ones that I came up with. Anything else stand out to you for the 1990s? Once again, I got a list here and I'm just going to uh, go through them just because uh, hopefully some of the listeners have uh, experienced these. Uh, the Spice Girls were super popular in the 1990s. Uh, obviously, uh, Steve Urkel from uh, Family yeah. Matters. I thought that was a good one. Um, yeah. Wednesday Adams from the, uh, from the Adams Family. I mean, hey, you could choose anyone from the Adams Family because uh, the movies came out and they were great. Uh, another one for, for a group, uh, we would be the Sanderson sisters from Hocus Pocus. So that's a bit of a tra- uh, you know, uh, thing with the witch theme, but more specific. Um, so I thought that was a really good one. Uh, you've got Toy Story, Carmen de San Diego, Trolls, uh, Mortal Kombat, Power Rangers, The Simpsons, Barney, Lion King. Like I just i i could go on and on like the 1990s as you said is so fresh in my mind uh because i lived through it but all those ones were extremely popular yeah so as somebody who grew up in this decade of those ones that you talked about which one really stands out to you is the one that if if someone said to you you have to dress up this year and the theme that we're giving you is 1990s which one are you picking oh that's an excellent question um Man, I don't, I don't know. I, I'm struggling here. Maybe Power Rangers. Yeah, yeah. I, I watched it before school. Yeah, so did I. I. I think that's. I think that. I mean, oh, I forgot to mention Super Mario Brothers. Um, that would be oh, another yeah. one for. But uh, I, I still think uh, Power Rangers because I, I, so many people watched it. Yeah, yeah. Certainly of our generation. Overall, would you say that Halloween? And the costumes that people use or wear on Halloween, do, do you think they represent something about the culture? So if you had a time machine and you wanted to go to a year and you wanted to find out what is important to people in that year, do you think going to Halloween somewhere and watching people trick-or-treating or going to a Halloween party, seeing what people are dressed up as, do you think that really tells you something about that particular time in that particular place? It's got to, um, obviously pop culture, as you said, being so important and having such uh, great reach. Uh, I, I just, you know, from when we were kids, whatever was most popular at that time, uh, the vast majority of kids wanted to dress up as that. Um, now, of course, there's the timeless classics that you're going to see throughout the, the decades. And I'm just going to list a couple here that I found, uh, which is, of course, we've mentioned, but the classic ghost. Um yeah. Or princess, cowboy, uh, pirate, a skeleton, knight, cheerleader, vampire, mummy. Uh, these are costumes that I think you're going to see right across time and moving into the future. You're still going to see um, kids dressing up with that. In fact, as I was putting Ellie to bed tonight, she said that next year she wants to go as a vampire. She's oh yeah classic yeah yeah and that's what i mean so it's just like already thinking ahead you know she's already thinking what can it be next year and so those classic ones are there but yeah i I think you're right uh uh, you get a good snapshot about that era and that uh place yeah and i i do wonder if this year given everything that's going on there are going to be some costume that come out of the pandemic um certainly that you know are going to be representative of this moment in time and uh 
that just happens all the time. I, I, I saw this thing about Ken Bone. If anyone remembers who Ken Bone was or is. Oh, yeah. Uh, in, tw- in 2016, right? There was, the New York Times went and found him and did an interview with him. And in 2016, that was a popular costume because that had just happened in 2008. Joe the Plumber was a popular costume during uh, that presidential campaign. So it, it constantly comes up that there are these things that are are really, I don't want to quite say fads, but things that don't have the staying power as certainly witches or pirates. Mm-hmm. So there you have it. Our list of, of costumes through the 19th, or excuse me, through the 20th century. Let us know what you think. Let us know what some of your favorite costumes were. Either head on over to activehistory.ca. You can put them in the comments. You can also tweet at me at the Sean Graham or Aaron Boys at Aaron Boys One. Let us know what you think. What did we miss on the famous staple costumes from the 20th yes. century? Because I'm That's sure we missed one. Something. Yeah, I, I want to know what we missed uh, because I, I loved doing this. Uh, a bit of the the research into this and the floods uh, of memories going down memory lanes. I'm sure you're the same. Just it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I did enjoy putting the list together. It was a, a good time for sure. So uh, so that'll do it for this week. Aaron Boys, triumphant return, my friend. Oh, this was this was awesome. Thanks again for having me on here. Always a pleasure to have you. Welcome back whenever you want to come on, which I know is rarely <laughs> in terms of you actually <laughs> wanting to do this. I just I wait for the producer to uh, to contact me. And yeah, he's uh, he's not the swiftest fellow. No, so I guess maybe I got to contact him instead. (laughs) Uh, But thank you. Hey, like I said, always welcome to come back. Everyone go follow Aaron at AaronBoys1 on Twitter. Let him know all the Halloween costumes that he could wear, even though he doesn't want to. (laughs) uh, Anyway, I'll be back. Thanks, Sean. All right. uh, Aaron, happy Halloween. Be safe. Eat all your candy. Steal it all from your daughter. It'll be great. (laughs) Thanks everybody for listening this week. If you have not yet, please do subscribe to the show wherever it is you get your shows. Give us the likes, the ratings, comments. That helps other people find the show, keeps us going. And also head on over to activehistory.ca. You can find all of our past episodes there, as well as some of the great written content that has been posted on the site over the past few weeks. So we'll be back with you again next week for another new episode. But until then... If you're out and you see Enrico Palazzo, please say hi for me. Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Be sure to check out Active History for more features, articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes.